SSP, we've had a couple of weeks off since the last lecture, but we were, we were just going to finish up Chapter 3, which is a really long chapter. Um, that's all the plan today. And if people want to give presentations, let me know. You can do that after the lecture. But um, there don't seem to be as many presentations as usual. We will charge ahead. So let's talk about security engineering. We left off here. And all right. So cryptographic attacks, um, ways to break through encrypted traffic. The simplest one to understand is brute force. You try all possible keys, all possible patterns of bits or letters for a password or something. In principle, that will always work because there are only so many keys. And if you try them all, you'll eventually find the right one. In practice, if the key is long enough, you'll never find it. If you have something in the order of 100 bits for a symmetric key, then that's long enough to produce brute force attacks because 2 to the 100 is an unthinkable number of calculations. There is nothing you can buy anywhere that could do that number of calculations, even in all the time in the world. So that's fine. Now, for an RSA key, you have to have 2048 or maybe 3096 bits to get this, this level of strength because RSA keys do not really use all the bits. They're only allowed to have certain numbers. Um, they use all the bits, but they, not all possible combinations of bits are used. So, all right. And so and then, of course, the main, main attack that works everywhere is social engineering. The smartphone pin scam. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, two of heart. You'll have to give me more information. Um, anyway, uh, and then the rainbow tables are commonly used here. Um, if you have stolen the hash file from a computer, then you'll have hashed passwords. And to reverse them, the whole point of a hash function is there's no way to go back from a hash function to the password. So what you have to do is just try many passwords until you get a matching hash. That's called uh, hash cracking. And so you get a large list of possible passwords and try them all. And rainbow tables are a technique that works on older hash functions, like the ones used in Windows XP. Uh, and you um, you can store enough pre-computed hashes in a math table in RAM so you can look up the hash and avoid doing all the processing required to calculate the hash functions. And that turns out to be uh, quite effective for old ones, old micro Windows Landman hashes, not so effective against modern hashes. And uh, let's see, they video record you putting in your PIN, steal your phone, reset your Apple ID, and then start, oh, I haven't heard about that one, videotape you putting in your PIN. So how do they do that? Do you get malware on your phone? Steal your phone. Sounds like a physical attack. Yeah, I'm not aware of that one. If you have a link or something, I'll add it to the news. Anyway, um, so if you can guess um, some plain text, for example, in WEP, um, to crack into wireless equip wired, wired equivalent privacy wireless networks, um, some of the attacks are extremely effective because on a wireless network, the packets are encrypted and the size of them is retained. So you can find the smallest packets and the most common packets, and those are ARP packets, and ARP packets are mostly all the same. So you can guess large portions of the plain text, so you actually know the plain text of some of the packets, and that can often be used to make an attack much faster. Um, then there's chosen plain text, which is even nicer. If you have a system where you can send up data, and the server will encrypt the data that comes from you, and then return it back to you. For example, if somebody is putting encrypted usernames in a cookie and you figure that out, then you can choose your username and get it encrypted. And uh, then you can carefully choose plain text that will reveal information about the, uh, the key. And there's a whole series of these that attach versions of HTTPS. Um, many of the padding oracle attacks work this way. Where you, and um, beast and crime and other attacks work this way because they're based on RC4, I think. Um, there's a variety of attacks that uh, rely on being able to control the plain text, which is often a case in HTTPS connections. So then there's meet in the middle attack, attacker in the middle, this sort of thing. Um, oh, there's now that's a man in the middle. Meet in the middle is very interesting. You have if you have something that has many stages of calculation, then you do half the the instead of um, cracking. I should have a picture for this, but I don't. Is, instead of um, is this is why DES was found not to be very secure. So uh, let me just draw a little picture for this because it's easier to understand that way. All right, so you have a system. Here's the plain text. Then you feed that into DES, and then you get ciphertext. All right, so here's DES, for example, an old encryption screen, and it's not strong enough. Now, you might think you'd improve it this way. 
you just repeat this and have a second round of encryption with the same technique, but say a different key. Okay, now you'd think this would be stronger, but it turns out this is not stronger. There's an attack. Now, DES has 56-bit keys. So the problem with it is this, that this has only got two to the 56 possible keys. And so if you have two keys here, one two to the 56, and another two to the 56, then if you tried to guess both of those keys at once, you'd have to do two to the 112. And that would be over two to the 100, it would be very strong. So what you do is you don't try to guess these two keys at the same time. What you do is take your plain text and calculate this intermediate value here. The partially encrypted value. You calculate that for all possible two to the 56 keys. And then you take the ciphertext and do one round of decryption and start doing that for all two to the 56 keys, and eventually you'll find a match, and then you're in. So instead of having to do two to the 112, you have to do two times two to the 56, which is monstrously smaller. So this is called a meet in the middle attack. If you can somehow define a point in the middle and do the calculation that gets you halfway there, and the calculation that gets you halfway back, then this cryptography is not safe. And that's why when DES was found to be insecure, the fix was triple DES, where you do three rounds of DES. That was the only way to make it stronger. Two rounds would not have made it significantly stronger. All right, and this is a common attack on crypto systems. If you can find some way to cut it in half, then it gets much weaker. All right, uh, you might also be able to find some information about the key. Um, if you can guess something about it, if somehow you have information about the key, then of course that, uh, that lowers the attack. And this is what happened to WEP. By, by gathering certain frames and doing mathematical analysis on them in web wireless networks, you were able to eliminate a bunch of keys and lower the number of possible keys down to a small number and then try all the possible keys. Differential cryptanalysis is a very powerful technique that was top secret military at the NSA for a few decades, uh, apparently, before being independently invented on the outside. And what you do here is encrypt two plain texts that are very similar but differ only by a few bits. And for many... Um, for many uh, encryption routines, they're not dispersing enough, so changing a few bits of the plain text will not have a uniform effect on the ciphertext. It'll only affect certain parts of the ciphertext, and you can deduce something about the key. Now, DJ is asking, how do you do the first decryption step? Well, see, what you do is, uh, in this situation, I'm trying to find the key. You've encrypted some plain text that I know, and you, you've turned it into ciphertext, and I'm trying to find the key. So. Um, you're doing double DES, I know how to encrypt and I know how to decrypt, but I don't know this key and I don't know that key, so I can find them. I try all possible keys here, which I can do because 2 to the 56 is not too big, and then I try all possible keys here. And when I meet a match, something equal in the middle, then I found both of those keys. So I just have to do two separate searches through a list that's only 2 to the 56 long, instead of having to ever do a search through two, through two to the 112, which would be impossible. That's to put a fact that you, can, you have a known way to get to the middle from both ends. One round of single DES will get you to the middle from this side, and one round of decrypting single DES will get you to the middle from here. You do have to have a known way to get to the middle from both ends. That's what makes the meet in the middle attack possible. All right. And then, of course, there's side channel attacks. These are quite devastating. It's, it's almost impossible to build a physical device that doesn't leak information. The time it takes, the power it consumes, the radio waves emitted while it's doing the calculation, all these things tend to leak out information about the key. This is very difficult to prevent. Um, the NSA had a Tempest project about this, and they concluded the only thing that's safe is to be in like an underground room with no windows and metal all around you to block the radio. Um, then, of course, there are implementation flaws. Often, um, even you make some mistake, like you leave the plain text in the RAM, or you put it in temporary files, or you leave the key somewhere on the hard drive where it can be found, and this keeps happening all the time. Just mistakes in how you implement it. Even though the math is fine, the actual algorithm you write or the equipment you build has a flaw like that, where the key is just sitting around somewhere. Uh, one really common one is people use passwords in their GitHub repositories or API keys. So the math is fine, but the secret is just lying somewhere. Then, of course, there's the birthday attack. This you use against hash functions. So if you are hashing something, it turns out that you only have to try 
the square root of all possible hash values before you'll find a collision. And so, for example, if you have month and day of birthdays of people, there's 365 possible birthdays. So if you start asking in the room, what are your birthday? Um, you find how many people will it take before two of them have the same birthday? And the first guess would be you'd have to have 180 people, half of 365, before you'd find a birthday, but it's much less. It's really only 23 because all you need is about 180 pairs of people. So the first one might match the second one, the first one might match the third one, the second one might match the third one. So 23 people has 253 pairs of people. And that means it's more likely than not that you will find two people with the same birthday. And so this applies to all hash functions. So an MD5 with 128 bits, if you just start calculating hashes of random inputs, you'll, you're likely to find a collision after two to the 64 calculations. So your hash function has to be really twice as long as the largest number of calculations you can do. That's why this is not considered secure. And even SHA-1 with 160 is not considered secure anymore. And the shortest hash function that anybody considers secure are now 256 bits long. So digital signatures are extremely important from the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. The people sign things all the time. They have legal weight of a signature, and they prove who you are. So you have um, a private key, public key pair. So if you take the thing you want to sign, you calculate a hash, any kind of hash, you'd probably use SHA-2 instead of SHA-1 these days, and then you, um, hash it, you encrypt it with your private key. And that is now your digital signature, and your public key is known, so anybody can verify it with your public key. This proves that the person who signs this holds the private key, and that proves that it's you because you never share your private key with anyone. It does not provide confidentiality. Nothing here encrypts the message. It just gives you a signature that proves who did it. And so you verify it. The person who receives it calculates the SHA-1 uh, from the, the letter. Then they take a digital signature and decrypt it with the public key and make sure those two things match. And if they do, that proves that it is from the person who held the private key and it has not been modified or the hash would change. So message authentication code is another way to do it. Um, CBC Mac is another way to do it. Um, this gives you authenticity using hashing and a shared secret key instead of a public key. And HMAC is hashed message authentication code, so it uses a shared secret and a hashing algorithm like MD5 or SHA-1. And these are commonly used in financial transactions and many other ones. You make sure that the, you know who something is from and you know it hasn't been altered. So the public key infrastructure is what handles all these public keys. So it handles digital certificates um, and all the HTTPS connections use them. You can have them bound to a person, but mostly they, people only get them for servers. Um, you can, in principle, have mutual authentication where there's an HTTPS key at both ends, but that's not what most people do. They mostly only on the server. All right. And I can't tell which page I'm on over here. Oh, here we go. All right. So here, the certificate authorities are the companies that create the certificates and sell them, although Let's Encrypt hands them out for free. Then you have registration authorities that authenticate users. Certificate holders are people who can sign documents and clients that validate signatures. And you have repositories that hold these and hold certificate revocation lists for certificates that are known to have been compromised. And there's a newer system called Online Certificate Status Protocol that is the new system to place certificate re uh, revocation lists. Both of these actually don't work too well. It's a weak spot in the public key infrastructure. All right, and so um, you have to protect your private key. If you lose your private key, then you won't be able to sign any more documents with it. And if somebody else steals your private key, then you can't trust it anymore and you'll have to revoke the certificate. Is it possible for CAs to be faked, like supply chain attacks? I haven't heard of that one. I've heard of them being hacked. They, of course, use cryptographic signatures. Um, but uh, six certificate authorities have been known to be hacked into, and people actually stole the private keys from the root, and that pretty much puts them out of business. Um, there was one that was faked about 10 or 15 years ago at DEF CON. VeriSign was faked because they were actually using MD5 as the hashing algorithm, and that humiliated them, and they upgraded to one of the SHAs. So uh, that's the closest thing to what you're describing there. All right, so if you want to back up your private key, then you probably don't want to just put it on your backup tape, because then if somebody steals your backup tape, you'll have it. So you might use key escrow, where you have uh, 
a third party trusted with it, or even pieces of the key with several third parties where none of them has the whole key. So SSL was the first system invented by Netscape to provide encryption for websites, and it's all versions of it are now obsolete, and TLS is the version where you, is the upgrade that we're using now. So here's the SSL or TLS handshake. You, you connect to a server. So first you do a SYN, SYNAC ACK on port 443 to open a TCP connection. And you haven't got any encryption yet, but now you've got a connection. Now you send up a client hello, and you get an ACK back. Then the server sends you a server hello, and um, you send an ACK back. And now you get a certificate from the server. Then you send the certificate off to a trusted third party to validate it. And after that, then you can use a key exchange, change cipher specs, get a session ticket, and now you can send encrypted application data. So it's got a lot of back and forth and a trusted third party before you have an encryption algorithm and then your data is encrypted from them. This is what we're all using and it's really quite good. There are various attacks against it, but none of them are very powerful and most of the time this makes you quite secure. I had heard the CN domain had issued a fake certificate for China's great... Oh, yes. Yeah, the Chinese CN domain did... China did issue a fake certificate for Google. Now, that has happened. Um, one problem is there's something like 100 trusted certificate authorities, and a certificate authority could lie to you. And your browser will usually trust any certificate authority. So um, there have been various attempts to fix that. Uh, ways, And the most popular one is now not public key pinning, but... Um, there's this protocol, I can't remember the name of it, where you put it in the header of your HTTPS server and it tells your browser to remember what the certificate, who the certificate authority was and not accept a fake one. Um, so that's the current solution for that. Anyway, um, all right, so IPsec is the um, encryption in designed for IP version 6 and it was so useful it was backported to IP version 4, so it's used a lot by VPNs now. It has, it's quite complicated, but considered very secure. It's got an authentication header and encapsulating security payload modes and uses ISACAMP for key management and ISIC, internet key exchange. So the authentication header gives you authentication and integrity, but not confidentiality. So it's like a digital signature to prevent replay attacks. So you can't record traffic and replay it. But the main one anybody would use is the encapsulating security payload, which encrypts all the data. And uh, remember, they said this really should be the only one in the protocol. There's no real reason to use the other one. Anyway, um, all right. Then, and so you, it makes a security association. You need to make two of them, one for one way of traffic and one for the other way. And um, that's the game. And if you're using authentication header and ESP, then you've got to have four security associations. So it's really complicated. All right, and uses these, these security associations, use these protocols, um, ISA camp, and something called the security parameter index, which is the identifier for a security association. And like most things in the uh, CISSP, you don't really have to know exactly how any of this works. You just have to recognize the terms and know what they apply to. All right, so there's a tunnel mode used by security gateways, and ESP tunnel mode encrypts the entire packet and transport mode encrypts the data, but not the headers. Um, all right. So Ethernet key exchange can use a variety of algorithms, so an encryption algorithm for confidentiality and a hash function for integrity. And uh, all right. Pretty Good Privacy is a public available open source product to encrypt email and other traffic using um, public key encryption using RSA public key encryption. Uh, Phil Zimmerman created it. Around this time, by the way, I was trying to write it. I think I was maybe 10 years earlier trying to write it, and I had only an 8-bit processor, so I couldn't get it working, which is a good thing, because the guy that got it working just had a, about a years of trouble from the government trying to block him for um, exposing what they regarded as a confidential secret, a military secret to our enemies. Didn't want him putting it publicly available on the internet. But eventually, the US government knocked it off and realized everybody's got public key encryption. They have mathematicians in China and Russia, too. Uh, one thing about this is it did not use certificate authorities. So when you get a public key, there's no way to be sure it's really a valid public key. So people would go to certificate signing parties. You would get friend of a friend. Somebody you know would vouch for somebody else. And there would be a chain of people that know each other that would vouch for the key. That was the 
alternative system of kind of certificate authorities. This is a very clumsy, very unreliable system, and I don't think anybody trusts it anymore, but it was the system, um, the web of trust. S-MIME is secure attachments for attachments and foreign character sets in email, and uh, uses the public key infrastructure to encrypt attached files to email. And then there's escrowed encryption, where a third-party organization has a copy of your pair. I mentioned this before, they might have pieces of a pair. There's just a way to have an emergency backup copy of your keys. And of course, the US government has many, many times tried to pass a law that they have to have all the encryption keys so they can decrypt all the traffic. Uh, Britain's trying to pass it now. Australia's tried to pass it. Many, many countries have tried to pass these laws. Some of them have. And then the government would be the escrow. And Microsoft even built this capability into some versions of Windows because they expected that law to pass, but it never passed in America yet. So, so far, this is not happening. But it does come by all the time. The government says we should really have all the encryption keys. Um, the Clipper chip was something very close like that. The US government defined this as the standard um, in 1993, and they wanted to put this chip in every device that would encrypt things, and the government would have all the keys. Um, it was recommended, and they tried to roll it out, but there was a lot of resistance, and they just abandoned it. It never really got deployed. And steganography is a form of encryption where you hide data in a file, and you don't even know there is a message. One form is digital watermarks to mark like a movie, so if you make an unauthorized copy of the movie, they can tell which one was yours and punish you for copyright infringement. Um, all right. So let's try a Kahoot. 3H. Three H. everybody. All right, so how do you defeat two DES? Yeah, meet in the middle. All right. All right. What attack deduces the key from the power consumption? Yep, that's a side channel attack. Good. What system ensures the authenticity of a public key? Yep, the public key infrastructure, good. Which is, you know, the network of certificate authorities 
handling those and keys and verifying them. All right, what system uses AH and ESP? That's IPsec, and like I mentioned, that's the level at which you have to understand it for the, the uh, CISSP exam. You don't really have to understand much details of how it works. All right. So this is pound pound. I guess they don't want the points. That's Rue Honey. I don't know who that is. All right. And uh, good, good. All right, good. So. keep going here. All right, now uh, we're talking about physical security. So you got fences. You can have three foot fences, which of course is not going to stop anybody much, but it does deter people who aren't trying very hard. Something like eight feet with barbed wire on top is considered preventive. It's difficult enough to climb over it. A lot of people will not be able to climb over it. And then there's gates. You can have ornamental gates that are just a deterrent, and you can have serious gates, class four, which are so strong that they'll stop a car. There's ones in between. Uh, there's a then there's these bollards, are the name for all these pipes, you see them everywhere. These are just intended to stop cars from driving there. They became extremely common in America after um, the Oklahoma City bombing, which was made 15 years ago when somebody drove a truck full of fertilizer and blew up a building. So everybody realized we don't want any cars driving near the building, so they put these bollards all over the place to limit where the cars can drive. They have lights, of course which can be detective, so you can watch things or even deter it because they come on and hopefully scare people away. Um, and you got closed circuit television, it's very common, uh, sometimes infrared cameras, uh, sometimes digital, and these are very popular all over the place. People are putting them on their homes and everything else, like the ring doorbell and so on. And uh, then there's locks, of course. The mechanical locks are the cheapest and most common defense uh, the lock you buy for $11 at Home Depot is not very secure, but it is easy to use. It has basically just a mechanical way of having a simple pin. You have maybe five numbers that go from like one to seven. So that's the depth of this thing. And when you push it in, it lifts these pins to the right height so the key can turn. So it's not very secure at all. Anybody can copy the key. You can pick the lock various ways by just reaching in with a bent wire and moving these while putting some tension on. A skilled person can pick the lock quite quickly. Um, and it's a useful skill to learn for penetration testing. However, it will stop a lot of attackers, even though they're not that hard to pick. Um, a lot of people just don't know how to pick them. So, all right. And then you can make a bump key is one easy way to do it. You take a key and you shave it down to the lowest possible position so all these pins are all the way down, and then you just shake the lock, like tap on it with a screwdriver, tap, 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 to just randomly jar, bounce the pins up and down until they happen to hit the right spot, and then you open it. And that can open the thing in 30 seconds or a minute or so frequently. So these things are really a lot less secure than people think they are, but they're what most everybody uses, just like passwords, because although they're not very secure, they're cheap and easy to use, and they do offer some level of security. All right, you can have a master key that will open all the locks, or a core key that will remove the core so it's easy to interchange the, uh, the key to rekey things quickly. Um, and then you got these combination locks, which are also a pretty weak control. These things are weaker than you think they are. Um, they don't really have 36 unique locations. There's only gear in there with something like eight positions, so there are patterns you can use to deduce the, uh, the key. You can go online and find tick. You just have to pull on this and go to the one that you can feel the jolt when it passes. Um, by understanding how they work, there are ways to get in. But anyway, just like the ordinary key lock, they'll stop people who don't know how to uh, break into them. Um, all right, and then there's a smart card which, like credit cards, are now smart cards. It contains an integrated chip, and so you might have to put it into a contact device or just hold it near a contactless one, and now it has a cryptographic signature that exchanges with the device. Magstripes just have static data stored on a strip of magnetic material, like Magstripe credit cards, and that data is not encrypted or anything, so it's really uh, not particularly secure at all. But the smart cards are much more secure. Um, they actually use a different number, like a smart card, will actually have a different number for every transaction, so people cannot replay it. 
the older cards where you the rubber things where you go chunk chunk and just write down the number or the ones where you just type your number into some form online the merchant can just submit further transactions based on that number you're just handing everybody a blank check into your account the only defense is the credit card company watching for suspicious transactions which they do very vigorously and they keep the fraud down to about half a percent of transactions so there's a smart card common access card is another one you'll have um, and you know all right uh, so you can follow a person through a secure bore, wait for them to open it and just follow them. And if people don't know not to let people follow them through the door, they might let him do it. So you have to train your staff not to do it. Uh, a man trap is a good solution where they open a door, they have to close it to open the next one. And in the middle, they're in the middle and there's a window and a guard is looking at them. So if they don't really have a working authorization card to open the second door, they're trapped in there and you can just call the cops, please arrest this guy. So that's nice, expensive, but a good strong solution. Then there's turnstiles, like they have at BART, are supposed to only let one person in at a time. And as we can see, people can just jump over them, so they're a pretty weak control. Um, to identify forbidden objects, like weapons, this can be very hard. Uh, weapons, you might be able to detect a gun with a variety of metal detectors, but you can't really detect small things like SD cards, and this is why uh, Bradley Manning, uh, now Chelsea Manning, was able to just copy data on a CD and take it out. And uh, one of my guests talked about searching people for stealing company data when they left, and he said he never failed to find it. Um, all right, so then you can take motion. This is usually used to let people out. Uh, you lock all your doors, but if somebody is somehow locked in, and if there was to be an emergency like a fire, you'd have to let them out. So most doors have motion detectors. If you can get motion on the inside, they will open. So they might you probably work on infrared, they might work um, using ultrasonic or microwaves. They send out some kind of signal and detect it. Um, so this is actually an easy way to break into buildings. You shove in something that moves around like a balloon deflating, and it makes motion on the inside, and then the door will open. Don't use smart cards on NFC protocol. They're pretty easy to be copied or overturned in the history, and they need to be replaced. I did not know that. That's interesting. Okay. Anyway, um, all right. So you can also have these magnetic door and window alarms that just detect if the windows are shut, and then if somebody opens the window, it will ring an alarm. Those are cheap and common. And then you have doors, of course. You have to put the hinges on the inside, otherwise people can push the pins out of the hinges. And uh, I mentioned you can shove something in and detect a motion sensor on the inside, creating the door to open. It's one way to get in. Of course, you can shatter glass to get in, so you might have to get stronger glass. There's glass made out of unbreakable material, uh, bulletproof glass, glass with wire mesh in it, and so on. Um, all right, and uh, Flipper Zero, yeah, Flipper Zero is popular. That'll do simple replay attacks, but I don't think it'll fool my smart card. Anyway, and of course, walls have to go slab to slab. A lot of buildings have got an ornamental uh, ceiling at the height of the lights, and then there's a crawlway above that for air to move through, like three feet above it, and often the walls don't go all the way up, so you can just climb in there. Does Clipper use NFC? I don't know, the Clipper chip, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so you have to make sure your walls actually go all the way to the roof, so people cannot climb over through the ceiling to get from one area to another. And the same thing can happen with the floors. Uh, the, the server rooms tend to have floors beneath the floor where you can run all the cables and stuff, so you might be able to crawl through there. If you have sheetrock, uh, this the plasterboards between your rooms, you can easily break it or cut it. It's not very strong. So you have to consider the physical strength of the walls and the fire rating of the walls, whether a fire on one side is going to easily move into the next room. Then there's guards, of course. You can have professional guards with advanced training. You can have these amateur guards that really don't do much except observe and report, um, like, like mall cops. Uh, whatever you do, you have to give them clear orders, and people can often trick and attack them with social engineering. Um, then there's dogs. Dogs can be deterrent and detective controls, but the problem is dogs can kill people, and then you might have lawsuits and such. Uh, and then, of course, you have visitor badges to so keep track of who's supposed to be there, and everybody knows not to show them anything confidential. Um, so if you don't keep issuing new visitor badges with a different color every day or something, then people can save the badges and reuse them. So you might use electronic badges or something like that, so it's more difficult for people to make a fake badge. All right, let's try another Kahoot. We're up to 3i. 
Alright. Oh, Clipper was from the 90s. Yeah. Oh, that that thing. Yeah. I don't. No, I don't think they had NFC at that time. You're talking about the Clipper chip. Yeah, that was just a simple uh, electric chip. Nothing fancy. Hmm. That's fine. All right. from the 90s in the days of like the dial-up modem so the clipper chip uh, didn't use any of these fancy modern wireless technologies the bay i thought you might be met the bay area transit clipper card and it's a good question i don't know i think it does use rsa because i think you just hold it on thing and it picks it up so i think it's um, nfc it seems like nfc when i use it because you don't even have to slide it through your reader yeah, I'm pretty sure it's NFC. All right, guess we got enough people. So which one is a deterrent? Uh, time is set too high, but I'm not going to change it now. All right. Yep, three-foot fence is just a deterrent. Doesn't really stop anybody, but, you know, will just discourage people who aren't trying very hard. If you shave your key down to the lowest position, what have you got? These work on cars too. One of my students got a car stolen by a shave key. Yep, that's a bump key because you bump it to use it. All right. All right, so which one of these is a smart card? Yeah, the ICC is, uh, I think, the military smart card. All right, which one of these works like Doppler radar? <laughs> yeah, it sends out a signal, the ultrasonic, and gets the bounce off signal and determines if there's motion from that. This uses sound, Doppler radar uses, of course, radar. All right. So that's Billy. There's one twice. Good. And that's uh, probably the same fake student, all right? A non-student. And that's behind. Good. All right. So uh, let me stop the recording.